Our study of 1825 to 1850 noted the common use and making of alcoholic beverages among the Amish farmers of the Castleman Valley. When Benedict Miller died before retirement in 1837, his estate included a distillery and products. The distillery was among the higher priced items at the estate auction. After Benedict's death, his son Joel B. Miller took over Benedict's farm and shop. Joel also had a distillery, commonly referred to as the Stiel House. One set of Joel's financial records shows local sales of brandy and whiskey up to the end of 1853. I have not found access to Joel's other journals. Christian J. Miller was a son of Joel B. Miller. In a letter to Myersdale Republican in 1920, he reflected on his boyhood experiences on his father's farm. He describes one occasion in the distillery. I think it was long about 1865 when the last Applejack was made in my father's old still, and that batch consisted of about 25 to 30 gallons of the finished product, and that lot was made by myself. I remember very distinctly, and it had the kick and pep of a government mule if anybody partook an overdose of it. Christian did not hesitate to describe some of the less pious experiences of his Amish youth. He was about 14 years old when he made that last batch of Applejack. At age 28, he was a member of the Amish church. He married an Amish girl. The wedding was officiated by Bishop Joel Beachy. A year later, he bought a parcel of land from his brother Joel J. Miller on the edge of Grantsville. This was a parcel of the present-day Kenneth Yoder farm. The six-acre lot was bounded by present-day Pres uh, Pennsylvania Avenue on the west side and Miller Street on the south and Dorsey Hotel Road on the east. Later, Christian moved west and associated with the Christian science movement. When he sent his informative letter to Marsdale Republic in 1920, he was 69 years of age. He lived in Elmhurst, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. Christian referred to the Applejack as famous in the little country steel houses of the area. What did Christian mean by the last batch of Applejack? We understood that Applejack, made from apples, more specifically from apple vinegar, was discontinued in Joel B's distillery after Christian made that batch but distillation of rye likely did continue. Simon S. Miller, born in 1862, was a grandson of Joel B. Miller. He also wrote about Joel's home distillery. Simon's farm joined Joel's farm on present-day River Road. It's the farm where the road swerves around the barn Simon was in possession of Joel B. Miller's business journal, which today is housed in the Springs Museum. In a letter of 1920 to the Mysdale Republican, Simon wrote, like most well-appointed farms at that time, my grandfather's farm contained a still house. This still was never extensively operated. But when we remembered that this was only one of the many stills in an operation in Elk Lake Township, it becomes apparent that the consumption of spirits must have been considerable in those days, to put it mildly. Other records exist of alcohol involvement in the Amish community. Wilhelm Bender's business records show various transactions of distilling for others and selling whiskey as late as 1856. Joel J. Miller, not the bishop, but an Amish farmer in the cove near accident, had a distillery on his farm before he moved to Arthur, Illinois in 1869. The ledger of Solomon D. Yoder records a purchase of whiskey in 1881. Regarding Joel B. Miller's distillery, Simon S. Miller states, this still was never extensively operated. Commercial production 
of farmstead distilleries may have been discouraged by that time by state legislature. In 1849, Pennsylvania passed a law that required distilleries to be licensed uh, and to pay a fee for the license. In 1853, distillers were barred from selling to intemperate people. In 1862, the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania regulated the sales of liquor and imposed penalties on violations. Maryland also was giving much attention to licensing the sale of various products, including liquors. By this time, the railroads had become a major mode of transportation. No huge volumes of rye and its products could be transported from other areas farther west to the big distilleries in the east. Now huge volumes could. Did I read that right? The product of the farmer in the Castleman Valley as hauled by pack horse paled in comparison to the efficiency of the volume of the rails. The temperance movement was active before and during the period of this study. In 1846, the Baltimore paper, The Sun, printed a resolution of the State Temperance Convention that strongly promoted the cause of temperance. In the same paper, the temperance movement sang the glory of drunkenness while the merchants sang the glory of drink. This was more than a half century before the legal prohibition of 1920 to 1933. If indeed the national production of liquors shifted from the country distilleries to the large establishments, what of the experience of the Amish community in the Castleman Valley? Why did Simon S. Miller say that Joel's distillery was never extensively operated? Was the same true of other farmstead distilleries? With railroads available for shipping, the large distilleries may have monopolized the production of brandy and whiskey, and perhaps smaller distilleries produced mostly for private and local use. Simon S. Miller gives a helpful evaluation of Amish involvement with liquor in the days of his grandfather, Joel B. Miller, who died in 1885. Simon seems to be writing from the position of a teetotaler. He was an active member of the Amish Mennonite Church, a Sunday school teacher. He died in 1837 and is buried here in the Maple Glen Cemetery. Writing in 1920, Simon explains, the great majority of the people of that time actually believed that the, call, that the use of a certain amount of spirits at times was essential to their well-being. They probably saw no more wrong in its use than people of the present day, talking of 1920, see in the use of tea or coffee, while its abuse was severely frowned upon by the people of that day as it is now. Simon compared those times with later times. Indeed, if we are to accept the unanimous testimony of the few people still living, that's in 1920, whose memories hark back to the latter days of that period, drunkenness was not nearly as common then as it came to be later. Certain it is that the saloon, with its baneful influence as existed later, was then unknown. I find Simon's analysis helpful, not as justification of the Amish distillation and consumption of liquors in the past, but as an explanation from their perspective. Now I'm ready to go on to the Civil War if you're ready for the fight. <laughs> The American Civil War raged from 1861 to 1865. It was a conflict between North and South, between the United States of America and the Confederate States of America. The states in the Confederacy were South Carolina, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina. 
The secession of these states from the Union was a major issue along with the question of expansion of slavery as new states were added to the Union and eventually the issue of slavery where it already existed. Pennsylvania, a northern state, north of the Mexican-Dixon line, prohibited slavery. Maryland, a southern state, south of the Mason-Dixon line, permitted slavery. But Maryland did not secede from the United States and did not join the Confederacy. The population of Western Maryland was predominantly sympathetic with the North. The Civil War was a vast war with more than a million casualties. To quote one authority, it cost American lives, its cost of American lives was as great as in all of the nation's other wars combined through Vietnam. More than 100 battles were fought during the war, but none in Somerset County or present-day Garrett County. One major battle occurred about 80 aerial miles east of Grantsville on the Antietam battlefield at Sharksburg, Maryland, north or near Hagerstown. In Pennsylvania, only one battle was fought. That is at Gettysburg, about 100 miles east of Myersdale. <clears throat> but there were burnings of some cities in Pennsylvania. Closer to the Castleman Valley was a threat to the city of Cumberland. The Confederate forces had burned Chambersburg and were headed for Cumberland. There they, they were met by Union forces about three miles east of Columb Cumberland. This skirmish saved Cumberland from attack, but being within 28 miles of the Castleman River, the news of the event must have reached the Castleman Valley, including the Amish community. News traveled primarily through the newspapers in those days, two papers, the Alleghenian and the Civilian and Telegraph, based in Cumberland, avidly reported Civil War developments. These weekly papers served the Grantsville and accident areas. They included advertisements of auctions, lost animals, count of men subject to draft, men of the area going into military service, and celebration of Union Army victories. Of one celebration in Grantsville, the paper comments, the people of Grantsville have shown more patriotism than the people of this city, Cumberland. Another source of awareness of the war among the Amish of the Castleman Valley was the experience of relatives near Gordner in southern Garrett County and Aurora, West Virginia. The route later known as US 50 must have been a practical road for military travel. Soldiers, when passing through, demanded and took food, clothing, and horses from the residents. In the home of Jacob and Elizabeth Swartz and Truber, hungry soldiers demanded and ate griddle cakes faster than the Swartz and Trubers could make them. They ate the dough from the dough tray, consumed the milk from the swill barrel with its nutrition for the hogs, and drank the spring dry. They butchered a cow on site and took all Swartz and Trubers cows and horses. Leah, a young daughter of Bishop Daniel Beachy of Aurora, West Virginia, remembered in later life her childhood experience of soldiers camping out in her parents' house and she walking among the sleeping soldiers to get a drink of water. Awareness of the war among the Amish came close to home when registration was mandated by the federal government. When the war started in 1861, Manpower was provided by volunteers. Patriotism ran high. But after two years into the war, there were not enough volunteers. So the government in 1863 demanded all men of the ages of 20 to, 25, to, 20 to 45 to register. The available Civil War registration lists show that the Amish men cooperated with this mandate. Using the website of the National Archives, I constructed a list of 111 registrants from the Castleman Valley whose surnames suggest that they were descendants of Amish immigrants. 
I attempted then to identify each of the 111 names with an entry in Amish and Amish Mennonite genealogies, the AAMG, and to attach an AAMG number. The first step was to match name and age, as given on the registration report, with data in the AAMG. I then attempt, attempted to identify who of the 111 were members of the Amish church. In doing so, I wished for a complete list of Amish baptisms, excommunications, and reinstatements. Since we do not have those records, I relied on contributing factors, such as family of origin, family of the subject, marital connections, place of residence, occupation, obituary, and understanding of, church, of Amish church polity. Using that information, I identified 48 registrants as Amish. They were three, there were three from accident, 16 from Grantsville, 21 from Elk Lake Township, six from Summit Township, one from Greenville, and, and Addison Townships each. Of these 48 registrants, 30, 13 were single, and 35 were married, most with children. When a given number of men were to be drafted from a subdivision, such as Elk Lake, for example, slips of paper were with the name of an Elk Lake res registrant. Each with the name of a, each slip had the name of an Elk Lake registrant, was placed into a drum. After the drum was turned, a blind or blindfolded man would reach through a hole into the drum and draw out a paper. This was repeated as often as a number of men to be drafted on that occasion. Draftings were conducted in 1863 and in 1864. Names of the draftees of the subdistricts of Grantsville accident were reported in the Cumberland Papers. Draftees in Elk Lake and Summit Townships were reported in the Chambersburg Papers. From these newspapers, one identified, excuse me, from these newspapers, I identified 18 Amish draftees of the Castleman Valley. From accident, from Grantsville accident, Paul Beachy, John C. Beachy, Edward Hirschberger, Moses Kemp, Joel J. Miller, not the bishop, John Miller, Elias Orendorf, Joel Slaybaugh, Daniel Slaybaugh, David Slaybaugh, John Tice, Samuel Yoder, Tobias Yoder. From Elk Lake and Summit Township, Manasseh Beachy, Elias Hirschberger, Emmanuel Hirschberger, Leonard Moss, Daniel J. Miller. So 18 Amish men were drafted. What happened in each case? What were the options? There were possibilities for exemption when a man was drafted, as, excuse me, as, a provide, as provided by an act of Congress in March of 1863. Supporters of a widowed mother or elderly parents or orphan siblings were exempt. And draftees could be exempt by hiring a substitute or by paying a fee of $300. Later, in February 1864, military leaders in Congress had second thoughts about some of these exemption provisions. They quit the example by payment of $300. However, the same act of Congress kept the 300 fee for conscientious objectors who belonged to churches that prohibited members from bearing arms and whose deportment was consistent with that identity. So COs could be exempted by paying the $300 exemption fee or by accepting assignment to duty in a hospital or to caring for former slaves. I have found no record of hospital or former slave care having pursued by Amish draftees. The provision for exemption based on conscience and church affiliation must have been a great relief for the Amish and other non-resistant people, but it also represented responsibility 
The qualifications of the draftee included his deportment. The Amish men were brought under the scrutiny of their neighbors. While most may have lived with consistency to a claim of non-resistance, there are hints of a few problems. I find unpleasant information shared by Christian J. Miller, son of Joe B. Miller. Christian was active in the Miller woodworking shop. Writing in 1920, Christian referred to the Civil War days and a prevailing loyalty in the Elk Lick region to the north. He refers to copperheads, a term applied to northerners who sympathized with the south. Christian reports with a degree of apparent glee that a sign was posted at one time on the Miller shop door, copperheads not welcome here. Would a more charitable attitude toward copperheads have been more consistent with the refusal to bear arms? One case of inconsistency from the perspective of a neighbor is found in a letter by Josiah M. Hay of Elklick. He commented about his Amish neighbors. The draft that drew his own name in August 1863 was the draft that also drew the names of four Amish men, Manasseh Beachy and Emmanuel Hirschberger and Leonard Moss and Daniel J. Miller. A year and a half after the draft, Hay, in a letter to a military official, complained about the provision of exemption based on conscientious scruples. He wrote, quoting Hay, there is a bad feeling existing among neighbors in our community on account of this conscientious business. He explained that his neighbors were the strongest advocates. I think I missed something here. He explained that his Amish neighbors were the strongest advocates of the war and have all along done their best to get others to go. We have no record of the anecdotes observed by Hay. We do not know who said what, but given Hay's expression about 18 months after he was drafted and a year after he was inducted into the army, there may have been a weak or negative spot in the Amish testimony of non-resistance. There were cases of men from Amish families who served in the Civil War. Four brothers of the Yutsi family, Enoch, Samuel, Jeremiah, and Joseph, did not wait to be drafted. Instead, their patriotic fervor egged them on to enlisting. The connections of each in adulthood, occupation, place of residence, marriage, suggest affiliations other than Amish. None of the four was Amish at death, according to the obituaries. Their father, Daniel Yutzi, was an immigrant from Germany whose reasons for migrating, according to tradition, included escape from military conscription. Christian Hostetler enlisted after the drafts. His obituary reflects a strong lifetime patriotism. It states that Christian responded when Father Abraham, President Lincoln, called to defend the Nathan Union. De Bittieri notes his ardent military service, his claim of Amish affiliation, but also his debarment from Amish fellowship. The cases of the Yutzi brothers and Christian Hostetler, if they had been baptized by the Amish church, it seems likely that they were removed from that affiliation by their own initiative or that of the church. Now, I want to insert here that my conclusion concerning Christian Hostetler, he was referred to last evening, and Benny C. mentioned that he was Benny C.'s ancestor. And um, what's handed down in true tradition doesn't quite sound what I'm saying here. And I wrote this before having heard out Benny. I've got a little work to do yet on this, but I depended a great deal on the obituary itself and the comments were made there about Christian Hostetler. But uh, watch the historian paper as it comes along. Maybe there's something more about this showing up there. 
Now back to the 18 Amish draftees after receiving a draft notice. They had three options. One, enter military service. Two, seek to hire a substitute. Three, seek exemption. What option did the 18 Amish draftees choose? I could not find the answer to this question by accessing National Archives online. A huge percentage of the Civil War records have not been digitized, so the records could be accessed only by going to the National Archives in Philadelphia. Due to my limitations regarding travels, Others went on behalf of this project of the Castleman historians. Titus Peachy and Laban and Marianne Miller searched the Civil War records in the National Archives in Philadelphia. They surveyed the contents of more than 15 boxes of original records, many containing multiple books. Many of the books have hundreds of pages. According to one of the researchers, all were original records. Many of the book covers were, sh were shedding little pieces and were leaving little pieces on the table when we were done. The labels on the boxes included titles such as Register of Drafted Men Exempted from Service and Name Index of Exempted Certificates. These searches met unlimited, excuse me, these searches meant limited success. Information was uncovered on post-draft experience of 10 of the Amish draftees. Among the 10, there was no case of entering military service. Each of the 10 was exempted because of circumstances, a motherless sibling at home, a medical reason, or by paying the $300 fee. I regret, I regret that I have no documented information on the other eight draftees. But the record of the 10 suggests that drafted men who were members of the Amish church in the Castleman Valley were exempted from military service based on circumstance, medical condition, or payment of the fee. This view is supported by available biographical information on the eight men and by a tradition that the church provided exemption money. The Amish Church of the Castleman Valley paid out $16,000 in commutation fees for its members during the Civil War, according to one tradition. The number seems too high for payment within the Amish church alone. 16,000 divided by 300 would equal 53 payments, but it is conceivable that 53 payments were made not only for Amish draftees, but also for Dunkards and Mennonites and other cases of conscientious scruples. Such extensive church involvement testifies to a prevailing element of conscientious objection within the church. We have dealt with the Amish church and the Civil War largely in terms of statistics. Information is scarce on personal experiences related to the war and the draft. But a story has been handed down of the experience of the John V. Tice and family. It was told by Elaine Tice Yoder in Castleman Chronicle in 2006. Earlier, it was given by Esther Schwarzentruber in the John V. Tice genealogy of 1968, quoting from an earlier Tice genealogy of 1945. John V. Tice was an immigrant. His place of birth is not given on his Civil War registration perhaps because they did not know what country or state to assign to one like he who was born on the ocean. John grew to adulthood, married Sarah Beachy, daughter of Jonas Be Bishop Jonas Beachy. They lived on the farm that borders the old Churig Glade meeting house on Foxtown Road. 
remembered by some as the Azer Schrock Farm and later the Park Opal Farm. During the Civil War, John registered on August 1863. Eleven months later, July 1864, he was drafted. John would have been taken to Camp Bradford near Baltimore, <clears throat> near Baltimore, along with other draftees. At the time of the draft, John and Sarah had three children at home. The oldest was age seven, the youngest age four months. Here is a story as told in the Tice genealogy of 1945. Although John did not conscientiously Although John could not conscientiously take up arms, he was required to leave home <clears throat> and was away three weeks with his wife and small children alone at home. This undoubtedly was a time of great anxiety for Mother Ties, as she did not hear from him until he returned home one night and for untold joy, she dropped helpless to the floor. John was one of 18 Amish rafties. We wish for the stories of the others as they received notice of being drafted, as they went off to Baltimore or Chambersburg, and how the question of exemption was processed. Unfortunately, most of those stories are lost. And that's a ways with a lot of history. <laughs> well, that's my piece on the uh, war, and I've, I've got a little summary of the period, but we don't have time for that. So, <laughs> uh, so back to you, moderator. Whatever you want to do now. There is a question right here. I have a petition. Could you read the summary? I, I didn't get it. Oh, he's hard of hearing, too. He's almost as old as I am. We're like the blind leading the blind. And here comes <laughs> where it's can. He does have a question. Have a petition. Could we have a reading of the summary? He wants you to read the summary. Oh. Or should I tell Lowell so he can tell you? Uh, I need the moderator's permission with the hour being where it is. Yeah, you, you go ahead. Yeah, all right. It's not very long. <laughs> you need some water. Uh, no, I'm all right. I think so. Thank you. Actually, nobody should eat before 12 o'clock, and we've had 15 minutes. By way of summary, we see this study of a church, the River Church, with enduring vitality throughout the century in a time when two other Amish churches of Somerset County did not endure. The Connemouth Church, Johnstown, closed its doors after many members moved west or chose affiliation with the Mennonite Church of the area. The Glaze Church, Berlin, disintegrated in the face of emigration and apparent internal disinterest on the part of those who stayed. But the River Church maintained a membership of critical mass, even in the face of many moving west and some family members choosing other churches. The River Church had ministerial, mem ministerial leadership in place. The River Church adhered to Anabaptist doctrine and conserved basic traditional Amish polity and practice. Some openness to change is found in the adoption of new songbooks and not much later, the building of meeting houses. When the year 1875 rolled by, the Amish church had been in the Castleman Valley for a century and was posed to move through, to move through the final quarter of the 19th century. Any last question, comments? 
I want to thank David for the presentation and your clapping thanked him as well. And if anybody's done research, you can imagine the hours and hours and hours that went into this particular kind of research. And in fact, the research on the Civil War, uh, apparently not much has been done in circles, of, in Mennonite circles uh, today. So uh, David was doing some fresh research. So again, thank you, thank you, David. I'm told that the, uh, there are recordings of this and for $2 a presentation, you can have those recordings. And also a reminder that next year, the third weekend in September, we will be dealing with the topic 1875 to 1900. And as time goes on, we're getting more and more current in terms of our own remembrances. And for those that uh, do recall, in 1881, the Amish churches built the four meeting houses, Cherry Glade, Maple Glen here, Narverton, and Summit Mills. Next Sunday evening at six o'clock, there's a hymn sing in the old Cherry Glade church house. So you can come and enjoy the hymn sing, <laughs> a church house 24 by 40, 42 feet in length. Uh, and when you met there, you were family. So again, thank you for coming out. And Delvin, have I missed something at this point? Uh, there's lunch being served downstairs. There's time for discussion and camaraderie. So thank you all.